Amen. Hey, y'all missed the snow for Christmas, but hey, we had it through New Year's Day. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> uh, let's just have an awesome time this morning. Hey, if this is the new year, 2020 is over with. Let's take that junk behind us and just get ready to start out with a, a good, a good year this year.
writer of this song really had some enlightenment about the, the spirit of fear, didn't he? Did you pay close attention to those words? When he told you you're not good enough, and that happens. When he told you you're not right, when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight, when he told you you're not worthy, when he told you you're not loved, when he told you you're not beautiful, that you would never be enough. Oh, fear is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire. Because fear, he is a liar. When he told you, you were troubled. You'll forever be alone. When he told you you should run away, you'd never find a home. When he told you you were dirty and you should be ashamed. When he told you you could be the one that grace could never change. Wow, wow, what accusation. Let your fear fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel. I think in Jimmy Swaggart's book he wrote, uh, There is a River, and what a wonderful song in itself. But uh, in that book, There is a River, he was talking about when he was flying the plane, something went wrong, and uh, he said fear took over his thoughts uh, of how to fly the plane. He said his knees literally smoked together. Have you been that afraid? I've been almost that fearful. And maybe not almost. I think there were times I was that fearful that the spirit of fear gripped me and my knees actually smoked together. And the, the, you can't hardly breathe. Fear will really do a number on you, but God didn't mean for the uh, believer, the overcoming Christian, to be overcome by fear, because fear is definitely a liar. What a tremendous song this is. Sean Middleton, come and inspire our hearts, help us to grow in the spirit and in the Um, we're starting here we're starting a new year and uh, there have been so many memes about trying to put this year physically under our feet and blow it out of the water and all these things it's just as if putting the year aside is going to stop we're going to turn over a new leaf but we all know that uh, everything still lasts here we are starting this year all the pressure all the, the fears they're still all knocking on our door they're not they're not gone because we turned over a year account and we flipped midnight and all of a sudden it's a new year. And so there's got to be something more, doesn't there? I mean, I, I appreciate that, Richard, that uh, there's got to be something more. There's, um, and, and the question that we have to ask ourselves in listening to that song, Wonderful Lyrics, like you just read off to us, is, is God enough? Is he? Because otherwise we will drown. <laughs> and uh, hear everything about it will take us under. And, um, and so this morning's message, um, God put this on my, he always said this, I've had this on my, I've had the notes on this for a week and a half or two weeks, something like that. Um, so he put that on, on my heart, you know, back then, and I, uh, I was kind of going through this again last night just to kind of get myself mentally, you know, where I need to be. And uh, it's funny how things go together. It's, it's not funny. It's not a coincidence. But when God directs your steps, ultimately what he wants will be done. And and that's always my goal. And if I talk about spending time wanting to prepare your word and want to do something for God, it's, you know, I'm nothing. I must decrease because he must increase. He's everything. Yeah. 
And I, you know, we can say, well, Sean, that sounds self-defeating. You know, the self-help guru would say, that sounds self-defeating. So you listen to uh, Paul say, I must decrease, he must increase. Like, you know, why would you say that? I mean, it, because a lot of things uh, focus on the self nowadays. But the point is, when we have a resource so much bigger than us, so much bigger than us, why wouldn't we want that to control and be the thing that we rely on and rest on? And, and so my, my, my title this morning, if you want to call it, is I'm asking a rhetorical question like I do many times. Um, who will have your attention? And I'm saying that especially in the digital age that we find ourselves in. But I ask each one of you there and, and here with us, who will have our attention? And um, like I do, is it all right if I tell Joe? I ask, you know, of course you're going to want to joke, but of course you are, so why wouldn't they want to tell that? Um, in a Christian school cafeteria, a teacher places a note in front of a pile of cookies, or pile of apples. Um, or it's cookies. I don't want to read it one or time. But, um, it's said in front of the cookies jar. Only take one. God is watching. Further down the line, oh, I did it wrong. <laughs> it was the apples. <laughs> so I didn't read our read ahead. There's only take one, God is watching, on the pile of apples. Um, later, there's a pile of cookies. A little boy makes his own note and says, take all you want. God's watching the apples. Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> 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 All right. My, my own joke's right. I read ahead and I'm like, wait, I just pulled on you. If you know me well enough, then that's just how it works, right? Um, you know, it is, I guess that kind of uh, apropos of what I'm talking about here, that uh, you know, what does have our attention? Where is our attention focused? And and I ask that because there's so much in this world, and I, I want to set the stage with this in our lives now. Think about where we are with instant uh, entertainment. At the, the second you want it. How many of you need to watch, I mean, we were one of those that cut the cord recently and went to streaming television stuff. So it's like, okay, you can have that on, but how many have the TV on and then you're on this too? And no, that's on for noise because you're, and it, it's constant. These, I mean, we can watch something 24 seven. We don't have to wait. I mean, what happened to conventional TV time where you sat down and you flip channels for 30 minutes, right? Until you figure out what you couldn't find wasn't all. And now you just, there's a smorgasbord of digital entertainment being piped right into your walls at any moment. Um, I uh, read, this is a, an author had written an article on this topic and talked about, we're living in what they call the age of the spectacle. I thought that was an interesting way to put that. And what it meant, meant is that we are so captivated by the eye. Now, I'm going to digress because we may say that here we are today and boy, things have really went out of, you know, out of this world. But this, is, this hasn't changed. What I'm calling, referring to the age of the spectacle, has been going on for a long time. So, as a matter of fact, if that you here, I'd say, what's the matter? There, there's so much in the Word that describes similar things happening. Now, they didn't have a PS4 or 5, what they have to do. <laughs> you know, we didn't have gaming systems. We didn't have streaming Hulu and all those things. They didn't back then. But they did have things that would captivate the eye and therefore captivate the heart and keep their affections turned on to something specific instead of everything else that may be what they need. And um, I'm going to refer to this as an ear eye tension. And so the question is, and it's funny, Lexi and I were just having this talk, and I didn't bring it up because I wasn't going to give you any like hints on what I was going to be talking about this morning. But she was talking about how the children develop. This is in rocket science that kids develop language better the more language they hear. Shocker. Okay, so guess what? You spend time reading to your kids and focusing and giving, talking and having language, guess what? They have a bigger vocabulary. This isn't rocket science. This, I don't need to be an elementary uh, major to be able to get into this. So we put it in front of the, uh, what do we call it, virtual nanny. We turn the virtual nanny on in the front room and that's their teacher every day. And it's amazing how they don't gain, okay, so, Boom. We can validate some of this stuff with our own education, but this has been going on back for thousands of years that there's been this eye-ear um, tension. I'm going to refer to that. And Richard, you brought it up this morning, talking about one of the verses that uh, 
we were talking about you know, how, we, how we understand and how we learn hearing by the word of God. And I'm going to come back to that point. So the, the focus on that, you touched on that, and thank you for that. Because uh, here's a great one. Hebrews 2, 2 1 says, Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. How many of us have heard good teaching? We've heard good teaching, and yet things can steer us away. Richard, you just gave us a wonderful word. I'm repeating Sean leading worship in the girls. We just heard some wonderful words of hope and wisdom to try to combat what we just put aside in a year. We've got a new year coming on, and we're not necessarily out of the woods. And we just heard some great things. So the question is, what are you going to do with it this week? Will we focus and meditate on those words like the Bible says? Study to show yourself approved is what Paul told Timothy. Wanting yeah. to spend time in the Word. Because why? Because you know what? Whether we realize it or not, our brains are lazy. What do I mean? You kind of focus on these things all the time. I mean, I wish school worked. I wish, I don't know, I don't know wish... I wish you had a photographic memory where you just pick up something once and you got it and you go on the test and spit it out and get an ace your test and get grades. I wish it worked that way with us personally. Like, we heard something that was positive and uplifting. I listened to some uh, Elevation Church stuff this last week, and he had some great uh, verses, some stuff on there, and I'm like, this is wonderful. But how come I can listen to that and I can go a day later and I can be back and frustrated? Am I the only one that does that? Only one that does Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Out there, too. Um, am I the only one that does that? Why do we need constant reassurance? Because we live in a fallen world. And whether we like it or not, we do have this eye ear attention. Folks, something is competing for your attention. And the question is, you're the one in the driver's seat. What has your heart? What has captivated you? So and the reason I want to talk about this when I go back to the Bible days um, we can, how much of what we watch and we talk about, you know, whether it's technology or other, we're captivated by the eye. I keep bringing that topic up. But this wasn't any different back in the Bible days. You know what they did? They didn't have a smartphone in front of them, but they did have amphitheaters and Roman Colosseums. And you know what they did? They gathered by the multitudes. Why? For a spectacle. Because something was going to happen. They were going to have people kill each other in the ring. Sounds like stuff we watch on TV today. <laughs> um, it's not any different. We're, why do people do that? Why are we drawn to that? Why does the news focus on that? I get frustrated. It's like we should watch the news, frankly. No offense to the news brother. Put something out there worth watching would be my answer to that. Why do they focus if you turn on the news and now you're, you need to listen to Fear is a Liar after you're done watching the news? Why? Because it sells. Because it keeps you captivated. Why do you I, don't, I mean, the best news sites among them, and you can debate which ones you think are better or worse, but all of them have a common focus. You know what it is? The people that own those phones, those shows, those broadcasts, want your attention. You know what they do? They use enticing things to keep you focused on them so you always come back. Because if, they, if you keep frustrated, then you stay hooked, and you need them. And they need you to need them because they need viewers and they need all these things. I remember going through that in grade school. Did you ever do that? Where I remember they talked about, um, they showed us commercials and what was really going on behind the scenes. So that when you watch a commercial on a new toy, you're like, oh, you watch that commercial, made you want that toy so bad. And then you watch how they filmed it, and you're like, this is all designed to get the kids so captivated that they've got to have that toy. Then they're on their mom and dad's pain, like, oh, damn, they got to have it. I have, to, I have to have this thing. And what's mom and dad do? Okay. <laughs> quick game. Quick game on my face. Like, whatever it takes. Um, TV shows. Why do TV shows make cliffhangers at the end of the season? So you get to get all frustrated and go away like... And then now we got Netflix. Why do you think there's a such a thing as binge watching when that came out? Have you done that? Have you ever done this? Have you ever binge watched a whole season or half a season and you get done and you're like, well, I can't get that time back. <laughs> Was it worth it? Uh, I know we've done this. Holly and I have watched shows before and we're sitting there. Now, we should be better at this. Has anybody started a movie and been like, this is so bad I'm walking out before I turn it off? Okay, we should be better about that. Typically, I think we make this whole like it, uh, engagement you know, decision that we're like vested. So we've already started watching it and we're finish watching it. 
And then we get done. And two hours later, we're like, we're never going to get that two hours back. That was a waste of my time. Frustrated. You ever done that? You know what that movie producer does? Bravo. I got you. Why do they do that? Because they sell more movies. They do the more of everything. And the point is, you and I are led captive by those things. And it grabs our attention and it holds it. So the question is, and I'm going to bring this back, obviously, to my focus, which is on the Bible, because of my eye, ear, attention that I'm talking about. Every one of these things that takes us away, takes our heart away from God, can pull us away from the very thing we need to keep us focused and centered. Okay? And I would ask this question, I wrote this down. Is my media diet enriching my time with Christ or eroding it? Interesting question for yourself. Um, and it doesn't matter what it is. I, I gave you lots of examples, but why do they put, this is always a funny one too, scantily clad females in advertisements for Enter Here. I mean, there, one, they made the news of all that, and I can't remember which actress it was, but it was like Hardy's. And she's like scantily clad, and she's eating this great big burger, and it's like, is that, does she ever eat that? One. Two, <laughs> I don't think that works. But why? They don't sell us. Like, somebody somewhere is going to think, oh, she's really very pretty. I need her. <laughs> Whatever. But it captures their attention. So they do it. We can, we can argue it. We can try to say they shouldn't do it. But when it comes down to these things, these people are very smart about that. And they want that. I said, I wrote this comment down too. And I a college professor of mine brought this up. He used to use this all the time. And it works in everything. There is no such thing as a free lunch. You ever heard of that phrase? I go out with a vendor, and he's like, I'll buy you a lunch. Super. It's not lunch. He's trying to sell me on what he's got. He wants my time. So it costs me something. When I say, I say this phrase, and people say this very flippantly, they'll say, I wanted you to spend your time. Or they'll say, I'm wasting some time. Or I'm worse yet, killing some time. Done it? I've done it. I'm early. I gotta kill some time. Time is one of the most valuable things we have, isn't it, folks? When you think about it realistically. What do we have? I mean, every one of us would like a little more time. Someone's given a sentence, and now they have a, a life expectancy. The only thing they would like is time. They said that's one of the things Steve Jobs lamented the most when he was given his uh, health diagnosis and he knew he had, I think, the pancreatic cancer. He had something significant. He didn't have much time. He had all the money and fame and fortune the world could offer. And all he wanted was more time. He couldn't get that back. That's why the Bible talks about redeeming the time. What does it take to redeem the time? And God would have us spend more time with him so that our hearts are focused on what's true and right and just and pure. Because he won't let us get our affections off on things that are going to distract us and cause us to be fall away. I guess that's my point there. So, um, you know, we've got to decide what we're going to do and how we're going to flee these things, ultimately, because some of these things are going to come at us and they're going to all buy for our time. They're going to do this. I, uh, you know, I have a lot of different verses here that kind of talk about, um, yeah, let's do this. Go, Psalm 27. If you want to, you would. Go to Psalm 27. Some of that I'm going to do some of that. Psalm 27, 4. Let's go back to one. Actually, this is this. I, honestly, I didn't realize this was in here. I was focused on verse 4. So let me start with one and you'll know why. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came up against me, to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, think how violent that is. In this I will be confident. And this is when I get the goosebumps to read this, folks. One thing I desire of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Goodness. What does that mean to behold his beauty? 
you know, we can see stuff in this so spectacular. We talked in uh, Sunday school a little bit about. I love uh, Psalm 19 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. I'm a, I'm a sunrise, sunset watcher, and I know the girls are too, and a lot of people love. I, you can't paint a picture that can outdo what God can put up there for me. And then, you know, we kind of were making that comment in Sunday school that those of you that are fearful and frustrated, look up every morning or night and take inspiration from what God is doing for us every single day. Um, you know, there's something special about what he has and what he's doing for us. And again, it's about focusing and keeping something, what we have in front of us. Okay. I am going to turn you with also this. This is the next step that I want to go to. Let's go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2 and 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Okay. Um, th that right there. We must pay closer attention to to what we've heard, lest we drift away. You know, one place in the Bible that it says, you know, here's the word, though you know them. Yeah. How many of you know that um, we have to be reminded of this stuff? And I was kind of alluding to that earlier, but, um, you know, when it comes to, I mentioned the photographic memory, it'd be nice. But what is, when you had to learn vocabulary for like, uh, I mean, I took German or whatever language or, you know, whatever class you, you had to memorize this batch. Are you, is anybody here in the type where you can just read the list and be like, got it, eight plus on the test? Nope. And I found out when I back to school as a non-traditional student, one of the things I lost, lost, uh, lost partially was memorization, because I didn't have to do that as an adult that often. And why was that? I didn't realize how much effort it takes to put it in your head and make it stick. And I go, and kudos to actors and actresses that can learn the whole movie and have it down pat. But what do I have to do? Read it, and then read it, and read it, and read it, and then try to recite it, and it's like, wow. It's amazing what effort that takes, but you know what? Sometimes, when we talk about fear being a liar, sometimes we have to tell ourselves over and over and over and over that fear is a liar. Over and over and over and over. Till what? Till when? Till we believe. You know, I, I love, they always had a phrase that they used to have when I was in band. They had up on the wall, I don't know if they did, you know, by the time you guys were there, in there. But I love that phrase. I've never forgotten it. It says the amateur practices till he can do it right. The professional practices till he can't do it wrong. I love that. Because it kind of goes back to this point. You can go got it and then go into the test and be like, ah, I failed that test. I don't know what happened. You have people that do that with you that you go to school with. Like, ah, I spent 30 seconds on that test or great study and I don't know why I didn't get it. Like, I know. <laughs> you didn't have it in your head. You have got to spend time on this. And so when I talk about this, this dilemma between your eye and your ear, the, uh, our, the way we resonate with the Word of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And that's how we internalize. We hear over and over. That ear, that perception of being able to Internalize and get into your mind is so much more concrete than the visual aspect of what we do because this spectacle, we call it, things can become spectacle to us. They can captivate our heart, but the question is, and it can move us, but the things that we hear, that we meditate on, we talk about the Bible, talk, we talk about meditating on his precepts. It's the thing that we can go over and over and over in our mind to, to make sure we have it down pat. So, you know, I wrote this down in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 3. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Many times we do that too. We get stuck and we're like, you know, we don't want to spend time on something that we think is either a dull or a drudgery or, um, and I, I use this so many times, but many times we refer to this or church attendance or whatever you want to call getting our life straight as flossing. So we call it spiritual flossing. And that's how people put it. They put it in that category of spiritual flossing. What is it? We know we should do it, we just don't want to, because it's time consuming, it takes a second, you got to jam that thing between your teeth, and it takes time, I don't want to do it, it's going to make 
marks on your fingers. When you, so I just don't want to do it. It's annoying and it takes time. And that's how we do this. Instead of doing this, if we got a hold of the fact that this brings life and life more abundantly, it wouldn't be blocks and folks. It would be when it's time for me to get back in the world. When can I make more time for God? When can I allow that renewal? Because I need that reprieve from the, the fear and everything else that comes against me that would take me away. You know, I talk about that verse in Hebrews 2, that drifting. And that's where many times we get so captivated by the eye, the spectacle, the things that capture our attention that we don't realize we're drifting. So, and I've used this example too before where I, we love to go to the beach. And it's my favorite, our favorite thing to be out there bouncing in the waves, right? Just out. And invariably, we're out in the waves and Holly's up on the chair <laughs> watching us. And I'm out the girls or whatever. We're out in the waves and she's on the chair. But it's a perfect example. She's got the chair set and here we are bouncing in the waves. We're having a good time. And then all of a sudden, you look up. Wait, Holly's way over there. What happened? There was a current. I didn't know it. We were just having fun bouncing in the waves. The current was slowly pulling me down or pulling us away. And we had lost our center. We weren't anchored. Why do you think boats use an anchor to keep themselves steady? It's because it's so easy to drift. We can get off. We can get off course. Um, they talk about, I love boats um, and all these nautical things. And um, think about what they did before GPS and everything else where they had to use the stars. But what they did is they had to use something to focus to keep that ship on course. Because it may look difficult, but if they had, if they had something to keep their focus, uh, uh, I used uh, my dad example. <laughs> my dad always said before they used GPS with tractors, and he obviously was a farmer for all those years, but he taught me, you know, our, our tractor had that real hood ornament on the front, and what would he do? It's like, how do you make those roads look so perfectly straight? He's like, it just takes time to practice. And what do you do? You gotta keep something off of the distance to focus your attention. And he keeps that hood over another tractor right on it, laser focused. And you know when you look back, and it's a perfectly straight road. But you know what happens when your attention gets pulled away? Crooked roads. <laughs> and in our lives, uh, there's a metaphor in there somewhere, folks. I don't know. I can tell you, not a little farming, whatever, it's still the same. We can lose, we get the affectional drift off of where we should be if we don't have something to keep our attention focused. We need an anchor for our souls. That's what this word really is. It's not just a, a spiritual flossing, it's a check. I went to church Sunday kind of thing. It's a, I need something to keep myself in check, in line, so that when the storms of life, when 2021, that's starting off similar to 2020, no matter how much we try to tell ourselves it's different, it looks uncertain in front of us. So where are we going to anchor our souls to? Are we going to listen to that verse that he just, Richard just quoted? Are we going to listen to Hebrews 2.1? We must pay attention, closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. So, we, we just we can't afford to let ourselves get bored with Christ or the very thing that can actually keep us back where we need to be. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually reminded, Richard, too, of Matthew 13, and they, they talked about hearing they don't not, they do not hear. They, he used that, that uh, analogy to them. It's like, what do you mean by that? Um, okay, I'm, I could be bad at this, and I'm probably the only one who can hear something and not really hear it. And they, oh, okay, no one has to shut me down now. Come on. All right. Um, sometimes I'm listening and not listening. Does anybody else do that? I'm the only one that does it. Okay. Good. No. But they warned them in the Bible, they said, this isn't new, that what is it? You know what it can be? It can be this. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. What'd you say? <laughs> or whatever. And it, what is stealing our affection and attention? Sometimes I, I am listening and I still didn't hear it. <laughs> I thought my mind is doing that and I'm ooh, and it's just going. And I do that. So I apologize ahead of time. But there is a difference between listening and hearing. And I always, I've heard that analogy that says, you know, you were given one mouth and two ears. What do you think that's all? A God perspective thing, right? So, the question is, is, and I'm asking this again, this question, as we're kind of getting here close, is who has our heart? Lord, you have my heart. I like that song that talks about uh, that, you know, something really good. But 
You know, when we talk about what we're having to navigate with all of these things, you know, the things that are trying to buy for our attention would tell you that they are the, the epitome, that they're the, the very thing you need. And the people trying to sell them would say, you can't really live life without these things. And it's not just stuff. It could be something to go to, something to be a part of, whatever. We need sometimes, and I like this term, you know, we talk about fasting and people talk about in the church about what it means to fast. Because why do we fast according to the Bible, uh, at least from food? It's because we're trying to show that we're not uh, in control of anything specifically. And that's why they did fat and had fast. Sometimes this demonic oppression didn't come out except like fasting and prayer. Why? It took something to get serious. And many times in our lives, we've got to fast from the things that are trying to succumb, get us to succumb to them. And in our digital age, I would offer this up. Many times we need this as a term now. We need a digital detox. Now what does that mean? Do we need to throw the iPhone away? No, we're not going to call you on it. We're going to be part of your family and life and work and whatever. So I'm not saying smash the iPhone. That's not my point. But I do know that sometimes we need a time of renewal. We need a time of digital detox. Sometimes we need to put this aside and spend time in the present, in the moment with everyone. Because there's an eye-ear dilemma going on for our, that's vying for your attention, folks. And the world, if anything, would like to have you have a spectacle in front of you to captivate you, to capture your heart, and would want to take you and, and keep you to those things. I made this comment, too, that uh, just like we were just talking the other day about how most of our family like their coffee. Holly and I, don't, we like to smell coffee, but we're not coffee people. But everybody was joking about how having the coffee every day, and then all of a sudden not having the coffee, and all of a sudden what happens? We're not doing well. I'm having headaches and whatever. Why? You're, you're in withdrawal. You need your coffee back. And whatever it is, you can insert here. I knew a buddy years ago drank so much soda when he quit. Soda created this dependency with him. He was having massive headaches trying to get off the soda. How about that for something tough? Well, you know what? How many people have withdrawal over their digital device? Or withdrawal? How many people that try to do a digital detox may still have a problem where they're like, they said that there's an addictive quality to that. We researched the people, that constant, constant, um, you know, boom, quick video snippets just grabbing your attention. It is addictive, whether you realize it or not. And people that try to stop it do go through a series of withdrawal where they don't want to give it up. So it comes back to us wanting to recalibrate our purposes, our affections, and all of those things. You know, I made a, I, uh, one of my uh, favorite, uh, I took his comment up here, uh, and he just passed away this last year, uh, Robbie Zacharias, great uh, theologian. And he quotes this in one of his books, and it's from this gentleman, G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton. And he talks about the problem of pleasure. You think, well, pleasure's a good thing, right? But he makes this comment in his book, Can Man Live Without God? I'm absolutely convinced that the meaningless, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. That's why we find ourselves empty of meaning with our pantry still full. People are, are fighting this lack of um, drive, determination, and other things. Why? Not because they're so going through difficult times, struggling to eat, but because they're so overwhelmed with pleasures that they've become numb and desensitized to things. They don't even realize it. It's back to that whole drifting thing. You don't realize how far you went downstream until you can have something that gives you an anchor for your soul to bring you back to the ship. So, in all those things, and I, and I kind of mentioned this from Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon's so good about this because he, it says, um, here, here it is, Ecclesiastes 2, 9 through 11. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. This is him talking. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish this, it was all meaningless. Like chasing the wind, there was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. I spent my whole career doing this, or I've spent my time doing this, or whatever. You're saying, saying that's all worthless? Like, well, I count, Paul said, I count it all lost except for the cross of Christ. Why did he say things like that? Because 
This is what's going to give us the purpose that allows us to do all the other things with the energy, gusto, and determination that also lets us take ourselves out of the equation and make it about others and where it's more blessed to give than receive. All these things that we talk about being a positive. And let me also offer you this. It's kind of maybe my last closing thought here. <coughs> is that, let me make a statement here that I, I read that I really like. All pleasure must be bought at the price of pain. Let me say that again. All pleasure must be bought at the price of pain. What do I mean? Here's the difference. True pleasure, and the difference between true pleasure and false pleasures is this. For true pleasure, true pleasure you pay the price before you enjoy it. For false pleasure, you pay the price after you enjoy it. Now you know what I'm talking about? Things that we, I just save up money to buy that nice car. And then there's such a sense of fulfillment that I own that thing, I, but I spent time. It took me effort. I didn't get to have it. I had a delayed reward. But now I have it, and I saved up, and it cost me something. I had to, I had to not spend money where I wanted to, because now I have it, and I own it debt-free. So what's the opposite? I got to have that car right now, and I got it. And now what happens? The blast of those last. Now i got to pay on it for the next 60 months. I, now it cost me something my saying, Sean says, you can't buy a car with a debt anymore. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's a little deeper than that, maybe, like Mark Sullivan would say. <laughs> the point is, anything worthwhile is going to cost us something. And we'll be able to enjoy the fruits of our labor because we counted the cost. Because we spent the time, we focus, and we can see the reward that comes from all these positive things. Um, Colossians, or Corinthians 10.31. Pleasure for the mere sake of pleasure will leave you empty. It has to be a God-driven purpose yes. more than just enjoyment. So, so I'm going to do this as I'm kind of ending then here this morning is I, I want to try this test for yourselves. You should ask this question. Does the activity I'm considering bring me under its power in any way? Or is it the opposite? And this, do I have an uneasy conscience about what I'm doing or what I'm involved in? Does it feel like I'm drifting when I'm engaged in what I'm engaged in. And then we have to ask ourselves, is it a spectacle? Or am I having trouble with an eye ear dilemma again? And I need something to bring me back in check that will help me focus, that will help me do this. Psalm 1-1 says, Blessed is man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. That word blessed means, oh how happy. We as Christians want to have something that we can, like Philippians 1 9 says, I want to go pray that we grow in love, grow in faith, and we should be growing spiritually with that. So pray with me this morning here. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness, your blessing, and all things. Lord, you are a wonderful God. Lord, you are a, a, are a very present help in time of trouble, your word says. Lord, in the midst of the, all the difficulty we have around us, Lord, you are the rock. You're a rock that's higher than I. Lord, and we, we trust you, we focus on you, and Lord, my prayer this week is that you would give us discernment toward this eye ear dilemma, Lord. Is what our eye, the spectacle of our eye, taking us away from what we know to be true and what is letting us drift? Lord, don't let us have that affectional drift. Let us keep our affections focused on you and seeking after that one thing. Lord, we're going to give you the praise, and we're looking forward to great things this year. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen.